Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, and particularly uh, for this occasion to uh, honor Patrick. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, technology diffusion and healthcare costs. And I just want to start with a brief overview of some of the amazing things that, uh, that are going on in healthcare now. Uh, there's a, just four uh, examples of technology. One uh, is the, uh, uh, on the upper uh, left there is a, is a uh, new valve replacement for the heart that's inserted as a, uh, in, uh, through the vein or, or artery. Um, an amazing uh, technology. Another is basically an artificial heart. Uh, uh, the third is, uh, is Savaldi, which is a, essentially a cure for hepatitis C. Very expensive, but also highly cost effective. Um, and the fourth is, is uh, you see those mice uh, that are uh, quite close. They're actually joined uh, on their ar ar arteries and veins. Their cardiovascular system is conjoined. And it turns out that when you put together an old mouse and a young mouse, that all of a sudden the old mouse improves uh, that, that by, getting, by using the blood of the young mouse. And this is all suggestive of ways that we can actually find the, a, a, not that, of course, aging is a disease, but uh, can uh, uh, help uh, find a, a cure for the adverse effects of aging. So all of these are wonderful things. We look forward uh, to more uh, developments in technology. Uh, but they do come uh, at a price. This is a, a, an influential article in the United States that pointed out that between uh, health insurance premium increases, uh, tax increases, and a variety of other uh, costs associated with health care, that it's effectively wiped out all the productivity gains for a median income U.S. family uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 years. Uh, so. Uh, in the United States, people don't see an increase in their, in their paycheck, um, and part of the reason that they don't understand is because healthcare is so expensive. So I think it can have very adverse effects both on economic well-being but also on the, on the politics of inequality uh, uh, in the United States, and I won't say anything <coughs> more about that. Um, so, uh, but there is good news, and the good news is that the, uh, 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 the Dutch healthcare cost growth has been quite low. As you can see, um, it's well below GDP. When I think about sustainability, an overused word, but I think a, a valuable word uh, when you're thinking about healthcare costs. Uh, if healthcare costs are rising uh, at a rate that's less than GDP or maybe around GDP, then we're, we're okay. Once you get to 1% in excess of GDP, uh, growth, then we're in trouble. That is, you can see that there's going to be a reckoning in the future. But clearly, uh, this is a good time uh, after uh, quite rapid growth in the earlier years. So, uh, and I understand this is also true through 2015 and perhaps even 2016. Um, so there was a similar slowdown in the United States um, between 2009 and 2013. This is a graph that shows uh, in in blue, it shows the consistent growth in healthcare spending through the Great Recession in the United States. Uh, the purple line is uh, the growth in non-healthcare GDP. You can see the, the decline. And, and then the growth rate uh, has started up again. And you can see that the two lines are parallel. That means they're growing at the same rate. That means that during this time period, the share of GDP going to healthcare has stayed constant or, in fact, even dropped somewhat. So at the time, this was considered terrific news. Uh, one a very enthusiastic uh, health policy uh, advisor uh, uh, put it this way. A good metaphor for the US healthcare system, this is, remember, in 2013, is the opening sweeping panorama in The Sound of Music, followed by the crescendo of Julie Andrews' voice singing The Hills Are Alive with the sound of care process redesigns and incentive changes designed to make better outcomes sustainable at lower cost. Now, when I go up you know, into, into uh, Austria, that's what I hear, too, uh, when I'm up on the, in, on the mountains. Um, and, and this was uh, uh, considered kind of a victory. People claim credit for the Obamacare. They claim credit for a variety of reasons. Um, at the time, 
in, in an article in 2013 that I published with uh, Amitabh Chandra, I was not so uh, optimistic. Uh, uh, Len Nichols saw The Hills Are Alive. Uh, I saw The Hills Have Eyes, which if you've ever seen it is a much scarier uh, movie than, uh, than The Sound of Music. So, um, and, and the question is, why was I so concerned about uh, this, this temporary downturn? And the answer is because I'm somewhat of a pessimist, and I understand the forces of technology diffusion. When a new innovation comes along that's both profitable and can be applied to a large number of people, that's a recipe for a cost increase. And so, uh, so this is uh, back surgery uh, in 1992. Uh, in the United States across the 306 uh, hospital referral regions in the Dartmouth Atlas. And uh, fast forward to 2012, you can see dramatic increases in, in spending. You'll notice New England, which is up again in the upper right-hand corner, uh, it never really picked up on back surgery. This reflects the fact that for much of this time, there was very little uh, evidence from randomized trials on the effectiveness of back surgery. And it's still not well known um, uh, as to how effective it is at the margin. So we think that we're spending, a, we know we're spending more on, on back surgery, but we're not sure that in the red areas that we're getting as good results as we might think, because those are more likely to be those gray area patients where there might be a benefit, there might not, but they're certainly very costly. And so, in 2013, as I was looking ahead, um, this is what I saw, which was a rapid either projected or actual growth in proton beam facilities. These are a new technology, again, very, very expensive, uncertain value. And this led me to suspect that there might be an increase again. This might be just a pause that we're, we were observing. This is not a victory, but it's just a pause as new technologies get underway and start showing up on the balance sheet. So there's sort of, it's, it's, it's like stopping the tide. It's this in inevitable process as long as we're coming up with new and expensive uh, procedures. Um, and as it happened since 2013, you'll see this new graph. The red line uh, certainly suggests very, very rapid growth, right? The most recent data suggests we're about 1.5% in excess of GDP in terms of our healthcare cost growth. In other words, we are once again on an unsustainable path. And so uh, this is, a, this is a, a, to us anyway, a large concern. And I think it's a concern in all countries where there is, a, a, so long as there is an active and potentially beneficial growth in, uh, in healthcare technology, particularly personalized medicine, Precision medicine, all of these things are likely to cost more um, and, and, granted, probably provide benefits as well. Is this? Okay. So, uh, so you might think, well, prices, we know prices are higher in the U.S. Could, could the growth, the recent growth, be the consequence just of higher prices? And the answer is no. Um, the, the red line is GDP uh, price index, and the blue line is uh, one year percentage increase in healthcare. So, in fact, price increases have been remarkably moderate in, uh, in U.S. healthcare. So, it's really about quantities of new treatments, uh, new things that are uh, being provided for individuals. Um, so, that's why my, my guess is that this is continued diffusion of medical technology. Now, you might say, well, okay, you've just explained all of these wonderful new technologies. Isn't this great news for people's health? That is, it may be that we're spending more money, but think of all the health benefits that we're getting from the new technology. And um, one example of a new technology that I think has gotten a fair amount of attention are these things called ICDs, implantable uh, defibrillators. If you if your heart stops, it reboots you. It's like the paddles on the TV that, uh, that uh, get, gives you a, a, an early start, a fresh start. And um, in fact, if you look at the randomized trial data, this is from the most recent and influential study, 
um, you can see a difference of about 22% in five-year mortality rates uh, arising from the blue, li sorry, the, the blue line is the placebo, um, the green line is the, th the treatment, and you can ignore the, the, I'm sorry, the placebo is the red line, the, uh, th the treatment is the uh, green line, and you can ignore the blue line. That's a different treatment that, as you can see, didn't work out so well. But clearly, uh, the, uh, the uh, adverse outcomes, that is mortality rates, are much lower in the treatment group than in the control group. So we might say, OK, these are more expensive, but think of all the benefits we're getting. Um, the problem with that is when you actually look at what happens outside of randomized trials, you see very, very different results. That is, if you, this is using registry data that we have for each person who gets an ICD. We know a lot, a lot of information about the patient, about their ejection fraction, their class of heart failure, all of this different information which allows us to compare regions of the country and hospitals in terms of what kind of results they're getting. And as you can see, the, in general, the results are much worse in the general population than they were in the randomized trial. And that's because the randomized trial chose the best patients and the best doctors in the best healthcare facilities and academic medical centers like this. And so when you actually see how these things are done in practice, the results aren't nearly as good, suggesting in part that we're probably not getting as great health outcomes as we think based only on the randomized trial. Now, in part, one of the reasons why these mortality rates are so high is because there are many more older people, that is people in their 80s and 90s, getting these procedures, whereas in the randomized trial, virtually nobody over age 70 got the procedure. And this reflects the fact that generally in randomized trials, they are trying to find an effect among the, most, the patients most likely to benefit. So anybody with comorbidities, they're, they're removed from the, from the trial. Anybody who's older, who has other related problems, they're out of the trial. And, but the problem is that when the trials come out, all of a sudden, uh, insurance companies begin to pay. And what's actually performed is quite different from what happens in the trial. So this is, again, another concern suggesting that we're spending a lot of money, but we may not getting, be getting the value that we think we are. So I pointed out a few problems. Um, it's only fair to suggest some solutions. Uh, these are, I think, for the most part, uh, implementable. I'm not suggesting we change or move away from any uh, fundamental healthcare systems in which we, each country is, is quite embedded. Um, so one possibility would be to regulate the location and number of new large-scale technologies. So regulation should be an active tool that's, that's designed to to ensure that there's no, none of these medical arms races in which every hospital or every medical center wants to be the one with the newest shiny technology. Instead, there should be a centralized allocation method, I think, in all countries. Second is, use these clinical registries. They are amazing. If you get the hospitals and the physicians to fill out the detailed clinical uh, evidence on patients, this allows you to identify both the best and the worst providers. And that's very useful if, for example, you want to restrict the use of technology to one or two best performing centers. Given this is such a small country, it's not that hard to travel to the next city over to get care if it means much better outcomes. Quick data feedback to monitor rapidly diffusing treatments. I would recommend if something, say, cataracts are, are, are expanding very rapidly, the quicker you find out and the quicker you can adjust the price downward <laughs> to make sure that, uh, that, that to kind of bring, the, bring the, the, the rate of diffusion back down again, uh, I think the better off you'll be because you can prevent it from becoming the norm or the standard uh, rates of treatment. Uh, also, you might use uh, data feedback, this was suggested by several folks yesterday uh, at an earlier seminar, to monitor the de-adoption, or what I call the exnovation of old technologies. 
One of the reasons I think why healthcare costs plateaued in the United States was that for many procedures, they were actually declining in their use. These are carotid and arterectomies. Uh, during this period of time when there was a, a leveling of healthcare costs, they dropped by about 35%. Uh, similarly for uh, stenting and for a variety of other procedures. If we can, if we can uh, keep track of procedures that perhaps have been found not to be as effective, that's, an, that's a win-win in terms of saving money and improving the quality of health outcomes. Finally, uh, used, I would recommend bringing the patient into this, uh, making sure you're using shared decision-making so that we know that the patients actually understand both the risks and benefits of the new technology. Uh, Victor Fuchs, a famous health economist, uh, now uh, 92 and still going strong, I saw him two weeks ago, uh, talks about co-production, which is something also Paul Batalden, a great uh, quality improvement expert, has talked about. The idea that it's not the doctor fixing the patient, it's the idea that the patient works with the doctor and together produces better health for the patient. So on that note, thank you very much, and I welcome your comments. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, an excellent introduction. Um, I think we have time to pick up a few questions. Well, on your number five, mm -hmm. you say you share decision making. I agree, but can I add, you can use it also to ask p uh, patients what uh, new technologies they propo propose to you. So patients are the ones who have the most innovative ideas, and you are using it not much enough. That, that's a very good point. I completely agree. And I think, um, for, in, in fact, in a lot of the um, translational uh, centers now in, in the United States, it is, uh, there are patient panels that say, look, you're trying to fix this. That doesn't bother me. You need to do this. And I think that's exactly right. And it's, it's, in some sense, it's crowdsourcing from patients to direct research, and that's a terrific idea. Okay. Very good, yeah. Peter. Thank you very much for a, for a very nice and quick overview. May I go to the first point? Um, this issue of regulation of the location and number of new technologies. In what, what kind of structure of governance do you need to do that? Um, and, and I ask that because uh, in the Netherlands we have this idea of regulated competition. And it's often difficult to combine that with the regulation. And because the, the location and, and of, of regulation of location of new technologies would also need a lot of cooperation and not, especially, uh, not only, at least not only competition. So what's the kind of governance you need for this? Um, that, that's a great question. It, at one time uh, in the United States, and actually there still is, what's called certificate of need regulation. That is, you are not allowed to build some particular structure without the permission of, an, of a board which, which oversees the state level healthcare facilities. And I would think such a board could come from, in, in the Netherlands, could come from the Ministry of Health. Um, in which uh, they bring together uh, experts to say this is how many facilities are appropriate for a country of 19 million people. 
Um, and if you have a, that number, say it's two, you then could have a competition to see who, uh, which medical group provides it. I, I was, I would gonna, I was going to say an auction, but probably that's not the best way to allocate in this case. Uh, but you could certainly have a competition where people, where institutions apply to be the one to provide this new treatment. Yeah, we, we had a discussion on this in the Netherlands, and the Competition Authority actually said it is uh, in the interest of, of clients, of patients, that there are various uh, locations for very expensive treatments, for example, the protonin bunkers. So it, you have to make sure that the perspective of the, uh, of the patient is present in this discussion all the time. No, th well, th I think that's true, but, but there's a trade-off between convenience and volume. And so the idea would be that if there were two rather than local, you know, local facilities, that, um, that the two would be, even though you'd have to travel an extra hour or so, that they would, they would have so much volume that you'd get much better outcomes. And it's interesting that patients don't always see that as the most important thing. What they care about sometimes, if, if they're not really provided with the information, is parking <laughs> or travel time. And uh, be, just because kind of probabilities are sometimes uh, abstract ideas. Yeah. OK. We got one last question. Yeah. I find the fourth uh, point uh, very interesting on the de-adoption. What, what type of uh, strategies do you have in place in the US to be successful on that? Because what we found out that it's very difficult to, to stop with things that uh, have no value. Or um, I mean, that's a great question. It, it's, uh, it's trickier still when, um, when the treatment still may, may be effective, say for carotid and arterectomies, um, among some, peop some patients, but among, say, asymptomatic patients, among older patients who have a lower life expectancy, um, then, uh, then you have to kind of direct people towards, uh, towards d doing less for a specific group. We found that in this 35%, basically all patients experienced a decline of about 35% in carotids. It's almost as if doctors sort of read the study and didn't, re didn't really recognize that it. it's like you, have to, you should reduce it for these patients and not those patients. It's just everybody came down. Um, but I think one can monitor this fairly easily and perhaps even adjust the reimbursement rates for specific types of patients. So you, I, I don't think you want to sort of outlaw things, or, but, I, but I think uh, uh, reimbursement rates are wonderful ways to incentivize uh, behavior. Okay, Professor Skanner, thanks again. Okay, thank you. Thank you.